Welcome to the Titan Talks webinar to listen to and learn from the very first speaker in our new innovation series. I'm John Corton, the inaugural director of the Petrick Idea Center at Illinois Wesleyan University. The Petrick Idea Center is a new 50,000 square foot living, learning, and creating community that we'll be building here on campus that will serve as the nerve center for innovation, collaboration, and creativity, all grounded in the liberal arts. The Petrick Idea Center will offer students, alumni, and the community lifelong learning and engagement opportunities. This new quarterly innovation series is a perfect example of what's to come. This, feature will, this series is going to feature alumni and university supporters who are creating, changing, and disrupting the products and service that will exist in the mid-21st century economy. Assisting me with moderating the Q&A segment of today's event is Dylan Kozlaskis, a junior majoring in finance whose hometown is right here in Bloomington, Illinois. Dylan is the founder of a recently launched cryptocurrency club at Illinois Wesleyan University, which is how we met last semester. A few housekeeping notes. You are viewing today's webinar as an audience member, and therefore you will not have the ability to turn on your video or microphone. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted through the chat feature. Alan will be answering questions throughout the webinar, and then he will take time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If you have any technical issues, you may reach out to the Office of Alumni Engagement at 309-556-3482 or by email at iwualum at iwu.edu. A recording of today's webinar will be available to view on the Office of Alumni Engagement YouTube page. You will be sent a link in a short survey later this afternoon. Illinois Wesleyan is very honored to have Mr. Alan Fisher as the inaugural speaker of our new innovation series. Alan co-founded and took two technology companies public in the 1990s, and more recently has been working on a financial technology startup. He is truly a serial entrepreneur and was recently highlighted in a publication as one of the top 50 angel investors in Silicon Valley. Alan has been a board member of several public companies, including Egghead.com, OnSale, FatBrain.com, and Infodata, Infodata Systems, as well as a number of privately held companies. With over 200 startup investments, he is a broad spectrum investor who regularly engages with entrepreneurs in many disciplines. Alan earned an MS degree or a Master's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University and a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Missouri. He also holds 16 patents and is the author of a book entitled Case, Computer Aided Software Engineering, published by John Wiley and Sons. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Alan Fisher. Great, thanks, John. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. So uh, is crypto the 21st century gold or fool's gold? Uh, well, the short answer to that is yes to both, and we'll dig into why it's uh, yes to both over the next uh, few minutes. Crypto, like any new technology, is really hard to get your arms around and understand. You know, it's a bit like the blindfolded men trying to describe an elephant. Every person can feel and explore one part of it, but nobody really has an all-encompassing view. My own area of expertise happens to be the left tusk. Specifically, my background is in software development. I'm a software engineer, uh, but also, as John mentioned, a very active angel investing and have been uh, looking at crypto or blockchain companies for the last half dozen years and even invested in a few of them. So that's kind of how I'm coming at uh, all of this. Today, we're going to cover what is exactly crypto, what's it used for, how it works, some of the problems with crypto, how to invest in crypto, and some wacky predictions of what I think is gonna happen over the next five or 10 years in this area. As John mentioned, please do enter your questions in the chat. I'll try to stop uh, during the presentation and answer a few of them, and we'll leave as much time as necessary at the end to answer all questions. So I'll be here for the duration as long as you are. First, let's step back a little bit and take a look globally at what's happening in crypto. 
These are just cryptocurrencies, the crypto tokens being used as monetary surrogates. And what's startling is that there's already over $2 trillion of money in cryptos. It's huge. Uh, comparing that to global stock market exchanges, if crypto was a stock market exchange, it would be the ninth or 10th largest stock exchange on the planet. And if you compare it to gold and the largest companies on the planet, Bitcoin itself, which is just one of the cryptos, would be the 10th largest stock uh, globally on the planet. Uh, it's, uh, uh, as you can see, about as big as uh, Tesla or uh, silver. So it's, it's absolutely huge. So what is crypto exactly? Well, fortunately, there's a very easy definition. Crypto is simply digital tokens that represent underlying ownership of just about anything. And if there's one point I want you to take home from today, it's this right here. Crypto is way more than just cryptocurrency. We all think about Bitcoin and Ether and Dogecoins, things like that. And we think about, uh, are they investable and in is that where we should be investing our money? But it really is a much broader uh, field than just currency surrogates. So obviously, uh, you've heard of them being used in gaming and the metaverse to buy and sell uh, digital real estate, so to speak, or gaming characters, avatars, uh, or properties of those gaming characters, which could be anywhere from Nike shoes to put on your gaming character to some special uh, property that uh, allows you to win at that particular game. Many of us have heard of non-fungible tokens or NFTs for short being used to represent ownership in artwork or collectibles. Uh, others are using crypto to represent coupons and even buy and sell real estate. So the whole area is really vast in terms of what crypto can be used for. Now, fortunately, this is nothing new. We've actually been using tokens for centuries. Uh, who hasn't used an Amazon gift card or some sort of a coupon? You know, Amazon gift card is what you get your dad because dad has everything, right? Going back a few hundred years to the 1830s, the brass token at the bottom is what's called a bar check token. It was given in change when you bought a drink in a bar. These things were smaller than a dime. So from the merchant's perspective, they had the nice side effect of being easily lost. And in fact, very few of these things survive today. So the point is, is that we've been using tokens in commerce for a long, long time. We've been using tokens for loyalty programs. Who hasn't used airline frequent flyer miles or hotel reward points? Or for those of us of a certain age who remember licking SNH green stamps and pasting them into those books for our parents, right? Um, loyalty programs have been around forever, just like gambling. Uh, so uh, why do we use gaming chips or poker chips to gamble as opposed to just cash? They're literally exchangeable one for one for a dollar, right? Well, because people gamble a lot more when they're playing with brightly colored pieces of plastic than if you're dealing with actual currency. But again, nothing new. This goes back to the 16 and 1700s when these were used in uh, gaming establishments in Europe or in private parlors. And we've all been to the county fair. I mean, who wouldn't prefer to spend five tickets to ride the roller coaster of death rather than to actually pull out a few dollar bills, which causes you to think about this more uh, as to whether you really need to take that ride or not. So, you know, these things have been around for a while and for services as well. Uh, subway tokens we all know about, but uh, merchant tokens, for example, the one in the middle from the 1800s uh, for an umbrella manufacturer, or the one in the lower right uh, was from a civil rights campaign in the late 1700s in England. Um, people didn't like the fact that Mad King George had a propensity for hanging people he disagreed with. And so there was a political campaign against that. And so all of these things have been around for, for ages. So what do we use crypto for today? So imagine all of those things that I just mentioned now being in a convenient digital wallet. So your airline frequent flyer miles, your Hilton hotel points, uh, all of your gambling and casino tokens, that's exactly what we're using it for. 
So of course, money, that's what we all uh, think about when we think of Bitcoin and crypto and so forth. These are some of the major ones and we'll discuss a few of these in a little detail uh, in a few minutes. Artwork, non-fungible tokens, the record so far is $69 million being spent for an NFT to buy what is essentially a screensaver, a piece of digital artwork from an artist who calls himself Beeple. Now I've looked at that piece of artwork. It's a very cool piece of artwork, but it's up to you to decide whether it's actually worth $69 million. But those of you from Illinois who've been to uh, the Art Institute of Chicago will see a lot of similarly valued pieces of physical art, so why not? The uh, CryptoPunk image on the screen here, believe it or not, sold for $97,000. Now, a non-fungible token is just simply a digital representation of ownership, not the actual piece of art, but ownership of that. Basically, it's a URL to a web server that says you own this image. Gaming is coming on hot and heavy. We've all heard the term metaverse, which is really just a fancy new term for uh, multiplayer, massive uh, multiplayer games, uh, where you go in and interact with other players. And as has been noticed over the years, the games that tend to be the most successful operate on a freemium model where it's free to play, but you can buy different avatars or characters or properties for those avatars with real money and get a leg up in the game. And so this is just simply morphing into crypto now is what's happening. So as you can see a list of these companies, the market cap is the value of the tokens, the crypto tokens used in that particular game. Where it says valuation, that's the value of the company in its most recent financing round. Gambling, of course. Um, DraftKings isn't there yet, but uh, a company called Zen Sports is. They have a token conveniently called Sports uh, that you use to bet. Again, uh, same concept. <laughs> you're gonna bet more if you're dealing with tokens than actual cash cash. Uh, and for collectibles, DraftKings has a deal, as do others now, to effectively mint non-fungible tokens for different types of collectible uh, merchandise. A lot of this is digital merchandise, um, but it doesn't have to be. It can actually represent underlying item, uh, physical items uh, as well. Uh, tradable sports card, there's even a company now that does uh, comic books, they do their own line of comic books and those are expressed as NFTs. So they create a limited number of these, typically in the thousands. And so just like being one of the first buyers of a Superman comics uh, or any of the Marvel comics, uh, there's a limited number of these things and uh, you can buy and sell them. And finally, crypto is being used for services, which I actually find to be one of the most interesting uses. In this particular example here, a company called Gather is uh, making a market in tokens that represent uh, computing power on cloud servers. And as you might imagine, the price of computation varies throughout the day, depending on what the demand is. It's just like demand for electricity or anything else. There are peaks and valleys of demand throughout the day. And so the price goes up and down throughout the day. So let's answer the question, is crypto money? Many people think it is. Obviously, there's been a progression from barter to gold to, to metal coins, which started in about 450 BC in Greece, uh, then to what we consider to be paper money, which really came about in the 1700s. Paper money technically is a note or claim against real money, which is typically viewed to be metallic, but we all accept it now as real money. So it is, if everyone believes it's money, it's money. That's evolved into plastic credit cards. Um, and now who knows where that digital money really is. Anytime we use a Visa card to take money out of our direct deposit account, which came from our employer, who knows, whoever sees this money, it's just bytes flowing around on a network somewhere. And so crypto is just viewed by many as the next natural evolution of this. It's just a cleaner, simpler form of what we've been evolving to over the last 50, 60 years anyway. Now, it turns out that 
countries are actually adopting crypto as legal currencies, not just as a surrogate, but as an actual legal currency. The first country to do this is El Salvador, who adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. They created their own wallet application. We'll describe those in a minute. You can see here on the right, that allows you to buy, sell, uh, and convert between dollars and Bitcoin. There's no transaction fee because it's government sponsored and there are various ATMs uh, throughout the country that will accept and convert dollars to Bitcoin and vice versa. Now, what's interesting about El Salvador and other Latin American countries is about 70% of the country's population receives remittances from outside the country, namely the United States, right? These are immigrants that have come to the US that are sending money back home to their families. And that represents about 23% of the country's GDP transferred from the outside in. The whole notion of a crypto wallet like this makes those cross-border transfers much, much easier. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Alan, come on, El Salvador, it's not a serious country. Well, many serious countries are moving towards crypto. You would certainly consider China, uh, Switzerland, Mexico, Brazil, and even the EU as serious countries. Uh, and they're all experimenting with so-called central bank digital currencies. Even the US Federal Reserve is actively investigating those right now. So um, there's a lot of movement globally. It's, it's not just for cross-border transfers. But here's where we get into the fool's gold part. Does real money behave like this? These, this is an interesting chart of peak to valley uh, tops to troughs of how the price of Bitcoin, which is one of the major bit, uh, cryptocurrencies, has fluctuated. So you can look back uh, in the 12, 13 years that Bitcoin has been around, those are some huge drawdowns, 30, 40, 80, 90%. Unless you're the Venezuelan Bolivar or the Zimbabwean dollar, no real currency behaves like this. Currencies are pretty stable and they may go up and down a few percentage points uh, relative to other currencies on a yearly basis, maybe five, 10% at most, but certainly not 70, 80, 90%. So that doesn't look like a currency at all. So what do people say? Well, an economist would tell you money is simply a medium of exchange, right? As long as two people decide it's money, then it's money. I would add to that, it's really three people involved in a three-way transaction. So it's one thing if Elon Musk says, you can buy your new Tesla using Bitcoin, but does Elon then turn around and pay his suppliers in Bitcoin? If he does, then I say, yeah, that's money. It's being used as a medium of exchange. If he's converting it to dollars to pay his suppliers, then maybe it's not quite money yet. The IRS says, however, crypto is not money. It's an asset and crypto sales are taxable as capital gains. The IRS doesn't even think it's a security. They cap, uh, they charge a 28% rate, uh, uh, just a standard cap gains rate. They don't use the more discounted 15 and 20% uh, securities rate. The SEC, on the other hand, says no crypto is a security, or many of them are securities, and therefore they're subject to SEC and FINRA uh, regulations. Congress really hasn't weighed in yet, but in the potential build back better, uh, law that's currently under consideration. Uh, there's a definition that says crypto miners and exchanges are broker dealers, which would make them subject to the SEC and FINRA, which would be quite groundbreaking. And many in the crypto industry actively oppose this for exactly that reason. There is a well-known test uh, in the securities world called the Howey test which was set by a court precedent uh, uh, many years ago that defines what a security actually is. And so if it's uh, something that's being used for a profit-making enterprise and it's being divided up so that there's fractional ownership, it's probably a security. However, I'm kind of with Clint. Uh, if there are two bosses in town, there's money to be made and a lot of people certainly are making money with this. Now, an interesting class of cryptocurrency are called stable coins. So unlike 
the common ones that you hear about every day, Bitcoin and Ether. There's a class of these called stable coins, um, uh, Tether being probably the, the best known ones, but there are others uh, as well uh, that are tempting to peg themselves to some underlying assets that is very stable in value to solve that peak to trough drawdown problem we saw just a few moments ago. So for example, uh, Tether is pegged to the dollar and supposedly they have uh, in their custody the same number of dollars or dollar equivalent securities to underpin all of the Tether tokens that are out there. You may have heard about Facebook, the company now calling itself Meta, uh, developing a cryptocurrency that was originally called Libra, but then renamed to Diem. Uh, that was going to operate or intends to operate as a stable coin. And uh, it is pegged to a basket of currencies, uh, you know, the US dollar, the Euro, the Swiss franc, uh, British pound, and, and so forth. And pegging currency to something of underlying value is well established. The US dollar used to be pegged to the price of gold under the Bretton Woods uh, Accord in 1944. So, uh, that's what made the dollar the world's reserve currency was that peg initially. So let's dig into how crypto actually works. How do you buy and sell crypto? This is, this is the easiest thing possible. You buy it and sell it just like you do with a stock. The simplest way is to go create an account at one of the many, many different crypto exchanges out there. which are really like stockbrokers. And here's a list, but there are many, many others. Even the popular um, online payment companies like PayPal, Square, and others have gotten into this. So you can go there and put dollars on deposit and buy and sell a variety of different cryptocurrencies. Um, so that's the easy way to do that. Um, a little more complicated way is to get what's called a wallet. Um, this is where uh, you actually take possession of the cryptocurrency on your phone or your laptop, as opposed to an account with another company. So that's kind of like having actual cash in your wallet, as opposed to it being on deposit in a bank. Okay. So like I say, the crypto accounts at one of the crypto exchanges is the easiest way. Uh, if you're dabbling in less common tokens and Nobody actually knows how many different crypto tokens there are out there. About four years ago, there were 1,470 tokens. There's probably 10X that number out there now. You can get a piece of software called a wallet. Think of it just like your Apple wallet on your iPhone or any similar sort of thing. It's just a piece of software that maintains all of your, in this case, crypto tokens on whatever your machine is. Now, suppose you don't like uh, some potential hacker uh, getting into your wallet or anything, you can put your crypto in what's called cold storage. All that means is that you put your wallet in some device that is disconnected from the internet. That means you can put it on a thumb drive, uh, you can put it on a computer that's just uh, turned off. And when you need to buy or sell or purchase something with your crypto or take delivery of some crypto, you simply connect it up to the internet, makes it live, uh, you conduct your transaction, and then you disconnect it again from the internet. So again, if you understand banking, if you understand brokerage, nothing new invented here, just new terms. Now there is a way to record all of these transactions, and that's called a blockchain. That's a common crypto term out there. And um, it's, it's really nothing more than a checkbook ledger. So if you're familiar with a checkbook ledger, or if you use Quicken like me in a Quicken ledger, you know what this uh, looks like. It's a sequential ledger. That's why it's called a chain. Each block or each file in the chain um, contains a certain number of transactions. So if you can imagine all of your checking transactions uh, in a digital ledger, that's all a blockchain is. It's a very simple concept. And as transactions are validated, they're added to this blockchain. And occasionally one block fills up and a new one is created and it just keeps progressing uh, like that. So pretty, pretty simple concept. 
Um, blockchains have several important features. Uh, first, it's immutable. That's a 50 cent computer science word, meaning it can't be altered. Once a transaction goes into the ledger, it can't be undone or changed. So it's, it's kind of like a banking transaction or a Visa MasterCard transaction. Once you've made that purchase, it can't be undone. They can reverse the purchase and credit you the money back, but that's a second transaction. Works the same way here with crypto. Uh, it's simply added. And if you need to undo a transaction, that's simply a second transaction that negates the value of the first. As I mentioned, it's sequential and can only be added to. It's public. And this is an important concept and we'll revisit this a little bit later in the presentation. And so everyone can see it. Um, and that's good or bad, depending on what you're trying to uh, uh, do with crypto. And here's an interesting thing we'll talk about a little bit later. It's distributed. So there's not just one copy of this. It's not like um, your bank where your bank has got a database of all the transactions or Visa has a database of all the transactions. Everyone that's got a wallet for that particular type of crypto has a complete and full copy of the whole blockchain. We'll see why that's a problem in a minute because as you can imagine, if you tried to keep the Visa transaction on a blockchain, that would be huge. You would not want that blowing up your phone and it would blow up your phone. Finally, and this is another important point, it's decentralized. Nobody controls it. There's no uh, server center somewhere out in the woods where all of this lives. Everyone's got a copy of it all on their individual device if you're using a wallet or, or have this. This is an advantage, by the way, of using a, an account with one of the crypto exchanges. You don't have to have a copy of the blockchain. Hey, Alan, uh, relating back to that last slide, we actually have a question from the audience, uh, kind of wanting to know more about your definition of crypto as a whole. Um, and they're asking, is this definition uh, being used more so as um, a means of, you know, money, finance, or is it insisting on not focusing on like distributed trust, like you mentioned with blockchain? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I actually prefer the term tokens to refer to ownership of a variety of things and the term crypto to refer to those that are trying to be surrogates for money, you know, meaning actual money. Uh, however, the common term is, is crypto, right? And so I think it's one of those things that's, that's kind of a sloppy uh, definition. So um, the, the whole point is everything that I've mentioned so far applies not just to cryptocurrency, but any of these underlying tokens that can represent ownership in anything. It all works the same way, whether you're buying a non-fungible token representing ownership in a piece of digital artwork, a collectible comic book, frequent flyer points, any of that, the mechanisms of how it works are pretty much the same. Uh, but to kind of specifically say, I think the, the better term is to refer to many of these things as tokens, um, as opposed to, to actual crypto, which implies money. So where does the software run? Well, I mentioned it's distributed, so it's not just in one place. It runs in all of these crypto exchanges in the upper left. If you happen to uh, uh, have a wallet, then it runs on your phone or your laptop, wherever you're running that wallet. Um, and these things all communicate back and forth uh, with each other. So there's a concept in many of the cryptos, not all of the cryptos, but in many of the cryptos of mining. And that kind of goes back to gold mining, right? These are folks that create the crypto. And of course, as gold miners or crypto miners, they own it, then they sell it to someone else. And that's how it gets out into the whole crypto um, network. These miners also get paid a fee for validating transactions. So when um, I decide to uh, buy a non-fungible token from Dylan here, uh, we agree on a price that's going to cost me two Bitcoin for this thing or, or whatever. Um, 
we have to validate that transaction so that it goes on to everyone's copy of the blockchain. And the mining operation does that as well. They perform the validation because it's the same underlying cryptographic um, process that goes on. The fee they get paid for this, talk about mixing metaphors, is called a gas fee. So <laughs> you've got mining and gas fees, you know, it's just uh, uh, goofy terms. I, I think don't worry too much about what it's called. Just know that somebody's getting paid for validating your transaction and actually placing it on the blockchain. Once the transaction is validated, it broadcasts to everyone for that particular type of token. And so it ends up in everyone's blockchain. As I mentioned, it's distributed, right? It's um, projected uh, everywhere throughout. Everyone's got a copy of that blockchain. The great thing about crypto from my perspective and the reason why I think crypto or tokens, uh, if you prefer, um, is kind of a groundbreaking um, revolution is that it's decentralized. It has many of the same properties as the underlying internet. The internet succeeds because nobody owns the inter internet. The internet is just a set of protocols, right? It doesn't matter what those protocols are. Uh, you don't know what TCP IP is. You probably know what HTTP is because you see that in the top of your web browser all the time. That's just a protocol. Um, anyone who's ever used Box or Dropbox has used an FTP server. You just didn't know it. Um, but nobody owns these things. There's no um, Facebook or Microsoft or Google that owns these protocols. They're universally used. Everyone uses them, and that's why the internet works. Everyone can join the internet as long as they use these protocols and communicate with everyone else. Same thing kind of with crypto, right? Nobody really owns these blockchains um, uh, or the software running on your machine or anything like that, right? It's... it's uh, um, kind of distributed. And that's why I think it'll be very uh, successful. There are governing organizations underpinning each of these different types of tokens. Again, another fancy term, DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Do not memorize that, it is not important. And these are sort of like governing bodies, just like the internet has a governing body you've never heard of. Uh, called ICANN. Again, don't memorize uh, that term. Just know that there are guys who set standards and uh, um, everyone kind of votes and agrees on a change to be made to an underlying crypto and it propagates out. So in summary of how this all works, everything with crypto or tokens has a real world analog. So fortunately, you don't have to really learn anything new here. Think of a token as money, miles, points, anything that you might possibly own. You represent that ownership either in an exchange, which is like in a, a stockbroker um, or the NYSE kind of all rolled into one. So think of it like Charles Schwab or Robin Hood or whoever your favorite uh, broker is, or you can put that those tokens directly in a wallet that you keep on your own machine, which is like literally a physical wallet, or maybe you put that in a safe deposit box. So that's kind of equivalent to storing your uh, wallet in cold storage, as they like to say in crypto land. Blockchain is just a checkbook register. So if you understand a checkbook, you understand the blockchain. Uh, miners are like gold miners. And then there are various uh, types of uh, crypto. Uh, so there are many funky crypto out there. Probably my favorite one is Dogecoin. We'll talk about that in a bit, but uh, um, that's really all there is to it. It's really pretty simple. But not all is well in River City. There are problems with crypto. So here's where we get into the fool's gold part of the discussion. First off, you will find nearly all crypto doesn't scale, uh, particularly they're all plagued with very long transaction times. So Bitcoin can only process a half a dozen transactions a second. So do you think Visa processes more than a half a dozen transactions a second? You bet. Uh, the number two crypto out there, uh, Ether or Ethereum, uh, is not much better. Some of them can do thousands of transactions a second, but Visa can process 10,000 transactions a second. And uh, anyone who's ever had to wait uh, while processing their card for the, because the 
computer is slow, uh, has experienced probably that limit being hit. Now, um, Ethereum, uh, which is a platform that supports the Ether token, um, is boosting that to 100,000 transactions a second uh, later this year. I would maintain even that's too slow, especially if you want to start to use crypto or tokens for so-called microtransactions. A microtransaction is just a very small monetary uh, transaction. So imagine paying five cents to read a New York Times article as opposed to buying a subscription to it or buying computing uh, power where you just need a few seconds of power, you know, just very small green transactions. You're gonna hit 100,000 transactions a second globally uh, pretty quickly. The real problem underlying many crypto is that it's sequential. As I mentioned, this digital ledger keeps getting incremented or added to in a sequential fashion. If you want large, processing volumes, you need to operate in parallel. Any experienced software guy will tell you that's uh, going to be the solution. Bitcoin, that's BTC, that's kind of the term people use to express Bitcoin. BTC uh, blockchain is, you know, close to uh, half a terabyte. Now, sure, we've all got two terabyte disks on our computers, but at the rate that this is growing, do you really want to consume that much space on your computer? No. In fact, does everyone need to have a copy of the digital transaction register? I think many of us would agree, no. It's one thing to be decentralized and for there to be 50 or 100 or 1,000 copies of it out there, but do we really all need a copy of it? No. There's no undo feature. So it's kind of like a debit card in that regard. So be very careful in making a transaction. There have been people who have fat fingered transactions, offered things uh, too cheaply, as you can see here with this uh, quote, a guy who sold a, uh, a non-fungible token um, and uh, lost a quarter million dollars in value. And, and that's it, there's no undo on this. It's, you know, it's a legitimate sale. Crypto can be stolen. And in fact, this goes back to the early days of crypto. There was an exchange, uh, just like Coinbase, that called itself Mt. Gox, run by a guy who legally changed his name to Kim.com. Any event, the crypto magically disappeared. It was like a $400 million hole that uh, just disappeared and they recovered some of it, but not uh, much. And so if you just look through this, um, 600 million, 500 million, you know, these are significant uh, thefts. It's also estimated that a quarter of all Bitcoin ever mined has been lost. There was a great case about two years ago where some guy forgot the password to his wallet. He had a hundred million dollars of Bitcoin in it, gone. If you don't remember the password to your wallet, you can't get it and uh, spend it. So uh, you are out of uh, luck. There's also the fake transaction problem. I mentioned that these miners validate transactions and one of the validation mechanisms people use with these tokens uh, is it's based on basically a voting mechanism. So if you have at any point in time over 50% of the voting power or validation power, you get to say what's valid and what's not. So if you want to validate a bogus transaction, and say, oh, you're sending all of your money to me, uh, you can do that just simply because you outweigh everyone else. That's almost impossible to do with the big cryptos like uh, Bitcoin and Ether because there are simply too many people doing that. But just like people can game the stock market with meme stocks that you've probably heard about where a bunch of people pile into a penny stock and drive its price, the exact same thing can happen with crypto based on the validation mechanism. Not all cryptos use a validation mechanism like this, but uh, many do, so that's, that's a problem. You're probably sensitive to the fact that crypto can use a lot of electricity. Some of the more popular ones like Bitcoin and Ether, which are based on computers doing very complicated cryptographic um, computations, use a lot of uh, electricity. So much so that early last year, China outlawed crypto mining in China. 
it was just simply draining too much electricity off of the Chinese electric grid. And as you may know, China, uh, most of their power comes from coal fueled power plants. So it's really bad for the environment if you use a lot of electricity. And that's exactly uh, what it was doing. And so um, the crypto mining, once it became illegal there, moved overseas, in particular moved to the United States. We have a lot of electricity here that's comparatively cheap compared to a lot of people. And some other countries like Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has um, cheap electricity because the government underwrites it. Well, guess what? That caused the government of Kazakhstan to fail uh, a couple months ago. It was draining so much electricity off of their grid that they had to allow it and force the government to uh, resign. Same thing is happening in Kosovo. And again, you know, these crypto miners, they just take their computers and they move to some other place, power up and away they go. So effectively, you can look at some types of crypto mining as trading electricity for crypto. It's, it's really taking one commodity and converting it into another. Crypto can also be created by anyone, regardless of their intent. One of the leading monetary cryptos is something called Dogecoin, which was literally created by two guys as a joke. Um, you can use one of these crypto platforms. There are toolkits out there that you can create your own crypto. Uh, it takes about five minutes to do, and voila, you've got a crypto. Well, this thing was named after their dog, it's doggy coin, but they pronounce it Dogecoin. And uh, guess what? There's 20 billion US that's been invested into this stuff. So uh, quite amazing. Um, there are also tokens called Unobtainium if you're a fan of the avatar. You might think that crypto would be great for criminal transactions. In fact, it's commonly used now for these ransomware attackers to demand to be paid in Bitcoin because money transfer is so easy with crypto. That's one of the great benefits of cryptocurrency. There's no such thing as a cross-border transaction. It's just simply a blockchain transaction that's everywhere. Um, but as I mentioned before, crypto is on a blockchain is kind of out there in the public, right? So if you remember that colonial pipeline ransomware attack that happened last year, the FBI was actually able to recover about two thirds of the $6 million that was stolen in that because they were able to learn who belonged to the wallet address this crypto was sent to and go and uh, reclaim that effectively, uh, being the FBI. So uh, if like Walter White, you intend to operate a criminal enterprise, stick with cash. Crypto may not be your best solution for that. So how do we invest in crypto? There are a lot of different ways we can do that. First, obviously, is to buy crypto tokens. That's what everyone thinks about, right? The, you now see prices of Bitcoin and Ether quoted daily in newspapers and online along with the major stocks. You know, it's uh, um, out there. Um, if you want to fight inflation, if you believe uh, the dollar or the euro is going to hell in a handbasket, then you might consider a stable coin that is underpinned by something other than what you're trying to hedge against. So if you think the dollar uh, is going to devalue, don't buy Tether because it's dollar denominated by some other uh, crypto that's denominated in some other asset. Um, you can buy a crypto ETF or mutual fund. And so some of these ETFs and mutual funds hold um, actual crypto tokens. Other invest in the infrastructure companies that are building software and other tools to support crypto. You can invest in the crypto platforms like uh, you know the, the stock brokers of crypto or tokens, um, like Coinbase, uh, Crack, and things like that. You can invest in the payment processing firms like PayPal and Square. You know uh, those guys are uh, going headlong into crypto as as well. They're big innovators in that space. Uh, you can invest in the crypto miners. There are about a dozen of these guys that are publicly traded on U.S. exchanges now. Uh, if you happen to like artwork, you can invest in non-fungible tokens that represent digital artwork or digital comic books, you know, a number of different collectibles like that. Or uh, <laughs> if, if you don't mind running a room of servers, you can mine crypto directly. Although again, uh, what you wanna do is set up shop where you've got the cheapest cost of electricity because what you're doing is basically exchanging electricity for crypto. 
So let's talk about a few of these in particular. Uh, crypto ETFs and mutual funds, uh, finance industry is always innovative. So over the last uh, uh, four or five months, there have been a whole bunch of ETFs and mutual funds that have appeared. This is just a uh, subset of them. This is not the full list. This is just a um, representation. Uh, I don't make any representation as to which ones are good or bad. Uh, if you are interested, I do actually track a complete list of all of these guys. And I send out a little friends and family email every day. It was just a spreadsheet showing uh, the trends that uh, each of these mutual funds and ETFs uh, is following. So shoot me an email if you want to be added to that. You can unsubscribe at any time. You can invest in publicly traded crypto companies. Uh, there are a bunch of these out there. I've mentioned a few, you know, like uh, Coinbase and, and uh, uh, others, and increasingly they're going public because they're large enough uh, to do that now. Um, there are crypto infrastructure companies that uh, like backed that makes wallet software or crypto miners like bit farms. There's a number of them. And again, I track these on a list. So shoot me an email if you're interested in uh, following along on uh, what the complete list is and what these guys are doing every day. Um, and then uh, metaverse companies, gaming companies. Again, think of metaverse as just a new term for uh, uh, multiplayer games. Um, so if you do any of these esports games, League of Legends, uh, any of these things, Call of Duty, you know what the metaverse is. Um, but again, if you want to buy uh, Coit Tower or the uh, home that you grew up in, somebody's got a metaverse out there where you can buy that. Uh, if you're an accredited investor, there are a number of venture capital funds uh, that invest in very early stage uh, startups. Uh, that's kind of what uh, I do as an angel investor, but there are a number of these that uh, you can invest uh, in directly different uh, uh, venture capital funds, or if you want to invest in startups directly, uh, many of these uh, you can uh, invest in through platforms like uh, uh, AngelList, uh, Link2, Republic, Start Engine. There are a number of these platforms out there for investing in startups. You may not realize it, but you can actually earn interest on your crypto. And I'll explain how that works. Uh, so we've talked about these so-called miners or getting paid verification fees called gas fees. One way these miners get paid is not necessarily by solving cryptographic uh, problems, but by essentially voting as to whether a transaction is legit or not. And in this case, you vote with your wallet, quite, quite literally. So you're basically saying, I have, um, uh, you know, a hundred of these tokens and I agree this transaction is legit and a bunch of other people agree. And if it's enough, then the transaction is deemed legit. It's added to the blockchain and uh, uh, everything progresses forward. And so what these crypto exchanges do is because just like a bank has a whole bunch of money on deposit, they loan that out. They essentially stake it. That's what it's called. It's called a proof of stake verification algorithm. They're saying I'm staking you know, this much of this particular uh, token to validate these transactions. So think of them just like a bank. You know, They're collecting gas fees or verification fees for staking those tokens. And they share some of that uh, with you, just like a bank does. You know, a bank turns around and makes loans, and it takes some of that interest and it pays it to you, and it keeps the the difference. So it's exactly the same type of mechanism going on here. There are now companies that will loan you money in dollars against your crypto. So if you happen to be one of these overnight crypto millionaires, uh, you can say, you can basically get a, a margin loan on it, just like you would get a margin loan on your securities portfolio, portfolio or a home equity line of credit on your real estate uh, with a bank. And some of the major crypto exchanges do this, like uh, Coinbase, uh, Nexo, and, and others. And in fact, there are finance companies that are getting, uh, uh, pardon the pun, state to uh, do this, to provide uh, loans. They're viewing it as an asset, just like any other asset. Uh, for years, you've been able to get assets or uh, uh, loans against um, things like your coin collection, your stamp collection, or your art collection. So they view crypto as no different. It's just another finance transaction. Now, 
let's get into my wacky predictions. And so here's where I'm going to go out on a limb and saw it off on myself. You may agree or disagree with this. I'm pretty sure Dylan will disagree with some of these things, but uh, here goes. Um, this is a safe prediction. I think many everyday things will become tokenized or cryptoized. So imagine all of those things that we discussed early on in this presentation that exists in physical form as a token or as moving online, like airline miles. Nobody's ever seen a physical airline mile. It's all digital, right? These things are just simply going to evolve into being um, online tokens, if you will. So just imagine your Apple wallet uh, or whatever wallet, but an Apple wallet is a great example uh, of it that holds your boarding passes today when you get online, when you go to a, an airport. Just imagine all of these different types of tokens being in some sort of a wallet, just mentally like an Apple wallet. You go to the grocery store, all your coupons are not in your purse, but in uh, your e-wallet, just like your miles, everything else, you just tap it does the right thing and uh, you're driving back home. Why? Simply because it's more convenient. You know, it's a natural progression. Like any new technology, nine tenths of the companies that are there are probably going to die. If you look back at the beginning of the computer industry in the 80s, uh, most of the companies, uh, even the ones that went public, uh, died and new ones came along, took their place because they had a uh, a uh, better way of doing something. Uh, you may think Google's been around forever. What you don't know is it was about uh, number 12 uh, search engine company. Uh, it just happened to do it a little bit better than everyone else. They died. And so now we use Google, you know, uh, as opposed to InfoSeek um, uh, or Ask Jeeves or any of those others, which you've probably forgotten about. And I apologize for reminding you of them. Uh, Cross-platform gaming tokens, I think, will become the currency of the gaming universe. And the key word here is cross-platform. It's one thing to go into one metaverse and use their token to buy and sell whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, it's another thing to take the value that you have in one game and move from League of Legends to Call of Duty to... Uh, pick your favorite game and pick up those tokens and use that exact same token as you go from platform to platform. But I think this is a natural progression of this. You'll wanna be able to sell your avatar one place, take the value of that and then move over to a different game simply because you've outgrown it or grown bored with it. Similarly, I think loyalty tokens will become cross-platform. They're already digital to begin with, and we already exchange them to some extent. We buy airline tickets for our family members using our frequent flyer uh, miles. So, um, and there are already exchanges that will allow you to trade these things anyway. So I think just moving them into a, a low friction environment like uh, crypto tokens makes a lot of sense. Now I'm gonna start to get out on the limb. Those things I think are pretty easy to, uh, imagine, but uh, the next uh, six or seven are going to sound progressively wacky. Anyone who's a merchant um, hates Visa and MasterCard because they charge you two and a half, two point seven percent transaction fee to transact. Um, they just kind of eat it and it's built into the price, but we've all seen cash discounts. You go to an Arco station, they pay you a cash discount Really what's happening is you're paying a Visa and MasterCard fee for using those payment mechanisms because they're frankly expensive for a commodity transaction. So as I mentioned, the value of crypto tokens is that it's a decentralized distributed mechanism where everyone owns a piece of it. There's no central um, mechanism that makes a profit off of these protocols. I think anyone who comes along with a monetary surrogate that can do this for 50, 60 basis points as opposed to 250 basis points uh, is going to win. Merchants will simply adopt these things, especially for online transactions. You already see many merchants uh, uh, taking crypto now anyway. Anyone who accepts PayPal almost de facto can take uh, crypto as payment because you can put crypto in your account. 
We saw this happening across uh, border money transfers with El Salvador. I think that's the advantage and why at the end of the day, they decided to create their own uh, Bitcoin wallet. It's to streamline those cross border transactions. What you may not be aware of is that the money transfer uh, companies like uh, uh, MoneyGram and Western Union typically charge six to eight percent. So uh, if you're an immigrant in the United States, uh, probably not being paid too well to begin with, um, having to take a six percent haircut on all the money you send home, ouch, you'd, you'd much rather take a basis point or no haircut to send that back home. And since crypto just sort of lives, you know, on the internet uh, somewhere, there's not so much of a currency exchange issue uh, going on with these things. I think uh, stable coins will become the inflation fighters. So if you want to bet against the dollar or bet against currency devaluation or bet on inflation, a, a way to do that is with a stable coin, but you want a stable coin pegged to something that runs counter to what you're trying to hedge against. And I think the easiest uh, is commodities. Um, commodities are easy to value. Uh, they're highly fungible. You can play them through the futures market. You don't have to play the cash market and take delivery of these things. Nobody at the end of the day wants a truck of grain showing up on their doorstep. You know, it's all cash settled. Um, and that's a great way to do it. Also, and I think equally importantly, is that commodities are easy to value and it's been the same commodity you know, for decades and centuries. Copper is copper, iron's iron, uh, cotton is cotton. Um, and that really hasn't uh, changed. So unlike the consumer price index, which gets in just, uh, adjusted because the car you buy today is better than the car you bought 10 years ago, that's a adjustment they call an econometric hedonic. It's a fancy word you can use there at a cocktail party. There's no adjustments you really need to make for commodities. That's why I think these are a, a good way to uh, do that. I think you're gonna see a lot of regulations passed and a lot of it's going to not make any sense. And so you're going to see a lot of crypto move around from country to country simply because one country decides to outlawed as India did a while back, and then they're gonna reverse course and, and let it back in. You know, so you're just gonna see a lot of uh, um, flopping around uh, with this. As we saw earlier, um, the US government, the SEC and the IRS even disagree as to whether it's a, uh, an asset or a security. Um, so it's likely to be inconsistent and cause a lot of Hair pulling. Sequential blockchain is just simply too slow. It doesn't scale. And so the blockchain will evolve to what I'm calling a parallel blockchain that allows you to verify many transactions in parallel without being based on the previous transaction set uh, having already occurred. You need that if you're going to move to microtransactions. Um, which I think is where this is all uh, headed. Um, and, you know, nobody's going to sit there, uh, you know, waiting for hours for your low value visa transaction to clear on the blockchain, right? That's just simply not practical. There's a corollary to this, and this is maybe the wackiest prediction out there. I actually think um, crypto will evolve to a blockchain less crypto, meaning no blockchain. So think about your real world wallet. You've got cash in it. If I decide to buy something from Dylan, I just simply open my wallet. I pull out some cash, hand it to him. That's the end of the transaction. It's not recorded uh, anywhere. It's purely private. Nobody else is looking at it. No government regulator is looking over my shoulder asking me for my ID so he can validate my transactions. Um, and charge me a tax on it potentially. It's just simply a two-party transaction. It's also super fast because uh, as long as he and I validate that transaction, we both agree that I've got the crypto in my wallet that I think I do, and he believes also that I have it, then that crypto can transfer from my wallet to his wallet. Uh, so I think there's a lot of advantage in terms of uh, privacy and speed, which is why a blockchain-less or blockchain-free underlying mechanism will be developed. 
I think you're going to see universal crypto as a service platform or platforms emerge. You already have that with Ethereum. You, you may not realize this, but some of these cryptos uh, you've heard of like uh, Ethereum and, and Ripple are actually platforms upon which you can build many different tokens or cryptos, right? Ether is the monetary token that lives on the Ethereum blockchain, but anyone else can come along and create their own uh, crypto on top of Ethereum as well. So you have to separate the platform from the actual token. Uh, Ripple is another good example of uh, that. They are working closely with banks to do monetary transfer and other things, and they have a monetary token called an XRP. But it, the, the point is that you've got uh, these platforms that are separate from um, uh, the tokens. And, and so I think you don't need a thousand different types of blockchains or mechanisms. You really just need a couple really high performance, high velocity uh, ones, just like the internet just works on a couple of uh, uh, protocols. You don't need five different variations of that. You just need a couple. And uh, this is one that's perhaps uh, going to be the least understood and least recognized prediction that I have here. Um, what makes crypto work is a giant mesh network. So if you think about a billion people with wallets, the transaction is made today on a blockchain that gets replicated to all of these wallets. So there's this massive um, distributed network that communicates this all around to uh, everyone. And that's super powerful. And so if you imagine information being transmitted around like that, in other words, it doesn't have to go through a central server, the way that your Facebook post does, you know, it just goes to everyone that follows you directly, as opposed to Facebook, uh, that's actually a very powerful mechanism and can be used for just information distribution or broadcasting crypto transactions. So again, this kind of gets into the plumbing of how crypto works, but I think it's a, a very powerful uh, network that had net set of networks that has been created to support uh, crypto. So wrapping it all up here, crypto is more than just money. And that's really the point I want you to walk away with. Crypto can represent ownership in anything. And I think it will, because we've already started to do that in a lot of areas, you know, like frequent flyer uh, models and so forth. Crypto's stored very simply in accounts or wallets, easy to understand. Crypto makes transactions incrementally easier when you can view your airline miles like cash and can deal with them just as easily. That reduces a lot of friction in a lot of our day-to-day -day types of transactions we do. And so I think that's why crypto uh, will take on and continue to grow. But uh, it's not perfect. There's uh, a lot of good computer science still to be uh, worked out to make this massively scalable, but I think that's going to happen. And since we're in the early innings of all of this, there are a lot of different ways to invest in uh, crypto if you're so inclined. Now, you can follow along, as John mentioned earlier, by joining the Titan Cryptocurrency Club. Uh, just shoot Dylan an email here and uh, he'll be glad to include you on the list and uh, keep you involved. Uh, if you wanna follow crypto stocks and ETFs, uh, shoot me a, an email, alan at alanfisher.com. I send out a, a spreadsheet daily. It's actually just a link to a spreadsheet and you can see who's playing and uh, what's going on with the price action and the different uh, uh, trends with these uh, uh, things. And with that, I'm gonna stop and open it up for questions. All right, thank you, Alan. Uh, so we did have quite a large influx of questions coming in there at the end. So we're only going to be able to hit on a few of them. Uh, we got one really early on though about the tax implications of buying, holding and selling crypto. Uh, Alan, you mentioned it a couple of times, but I would like to point out uh, one more thing. So uh, in terms of the capital gains, they are treated the same as stocks and securities in general. Um, but Bitcoin itself as an example is actually treated by, or it is, described to be property by the IRS. So there are certain uh, advantages to uh, selling it, for example, like a wash sale loss um, in stocks that could really not help you over a 30 day period, but for cryptocurrency it can because it's treated as property. So um, just to hit on that, cryptocurrency actually does have some pretty beneficial uh, tax implications to it. Um, the next one, Alan, I'll send this one to you. 
Uh, regarding prediction one, uh, I think there is a big difference between frequent flyer miles becoming tokenized versus blockchainized. In the first case, the airline company controls the ledger. In the second case, the control is distributed. Would you predict that when these things become tokenized, that the airlines would really be willing to give up control? You know, that's a, that's a great point. Um, and you're exactly right. And I think that's true of any loyalty uh, token. Uh, on the other hand, I think they'll get pulled in that direction and they've already been pulled in that direction. Uh, you can already exchange uh, hotel points for miles or vice versa. Many companies will reward you with miles. You know, if you buy something, you can get miles that you can then use uh, however. So they are already not fully fungible, but semi fungible. Um, all of these airlines belong to consortia, right? So you're a member of the Star Alliance or uh, you know, these various clubs, right? So if you get United Frequent Flyer Miles, I can use that on Lufthansa. If you get American Miles, you can use that on British Airways, right? So already this is uh, happening. So um, yeah. Um, it, I think it'll just uh, depend. Uh, there's already a, an Alaskan airline, uh, I can't remember the name of it, it's not Alaska Airlines, that has uh, tokenized its uh, frequent flyer miles and is headed down this path already. Next question. All right, moving along. Um, let's see here. Uh, how would one prepare and or invest for these predictions in general evolution of the space? So I guess they're kind of asking, um, how you see cryptocurrency uh, from your point of view as an investment. I can only give you my two cents. I'm not a registered investment advisor and so can't give you specific uh, advice that's illegal. I can only tell you what I'm doing. Um, this is like the early days of the computer industry. And so would should you have uh, invested in any of the half dozen uh, CRM companies, Remedy, Vaniv, Scofus, Clarify, um, Siebel, uh, well, at the end of the day, Siebel won, uh, Salesforce won, you just never know. Should you invested in uh, the obvious uh, uh, winner uh, in social media, which was MySpace, uh, then Facebook comes along and, and takes over. Uh, it's really hard to, to know. So my personal strategy is to make a lot of uh, smaller bets and watch along. So easy ways to do this with public companies or with ETFs and mutual funds. Um, uh, I do this with my angel investing. Uh, I'm not just betting on one metaverse company, one crypto company. I have uh, investments in uh, a number of uh, different ones. Uh, I can almost guarantee you the ones that will end up succeeding are not the ones you would have uh, thought. So my own personal strategy is basically diversification. All right, moving along, Alan, I think you'll like this one. Um, thoughts on the concept of Web3 and whether Web3 startups will be able to disrupt the Web2 market? <laughs> Uh, first, a definition. Uh, you'll hear, like many of these terms, a new one, Web3. Web1 is what we think of as the internet. It's, it's uh, websites, you know, like the Illinois Wesleyan website uh, or e-commerce sites like Amazon. Web 2.0 are the social media platforms, kind of these walled gardens where you interact with people uh, through one of those uh, platforms. Web 3 is sort of a blockchain or tokenized interaction uh, with people or, or things. Um, so as you heard me say, I think tokenization is inevitable because it'll be based on common free or extremely low cost to use platforms that aren't governed by any one institution, really any one company. That's why I think it will succeed. Do I think Facebook and Instagram are going to be replaced by a blockchain version of this? No. Do I think somebody could come along as you saw in my very last uh, prediction here and create a 
Instagram or Facebook a new platform that doesn't go through a central server, but basically broadcasts whatever it is that you post to everyone who follows you directly without going through a central server? Sure. We saw that uh, 15, 20 years ago with Napster, with file sharing, uh, you know, music uh, sharing. So, so sure, I, I think that's, to me, uh, something I predict will happen. All right. Um, what are some of the systemic risks, do you think, uh, of cryptocurrencies to the broader financial system, uh, given the leveraging practices that you've described? Um, I almost think it's unknowable. You know, most of these crashes or risks pop up when you don't expect them because nobody expected that uh, um, there was such a demand from European institutions buying mortgage-backed securities that incentivized Wall Street to uh, create these goofy securities that ultimately blew up and caused the global financial crisis, right? You know, nobody really knew that was going on, even though trillions of dollars were flowing through that mechanism. So I would almost bet you that, uh, uh, you know, if uh, one of the major crypto exchanges like a Kraken or Coinbase got hacked and uh, a bunch of crypto got stolen or disappeared, that might cause a liquidity crash. Uh, that's usually how these things start. You know, suddenly the value of what you thought you had disappeared. Say, say uh, Bitcoin uh, dropped from approximately $40,000 where it is now to say 20 or $10,000, right? And you've got a bunch of people with crypto loans out there, meaning they've gotten dollars um, using their crypto as an asset. Suddenly uh, those people have to sell other assets to pay back the loan. So that spills into the stock market or the bond market as more liquid assets get uh, sold. So the, that's oftentimes what you see with these things is it uh, something goes wrong and it starts a liquidity crisis. You saw that in 1998 with the uh, uh, long-term capital management uh, crash where these guys literally were leveraged 100 to one on pair trades uh, that ultimately didn't operate the way they thought they were gonna operate, that spilled over into the broad market as everyone then suddenly started scrambling for uh, liquidity. Uh, what do you think of the current moral ecosystem of cryptocurrency, NFTs, and other digital assets as a whole? Uh, the person who asked this question said they have large concerns for the negative impact of things such as rug pulls uh, or the consumer just not understanding how the transfer of these assets might work. Um, they think it's, it could be complex for the average person. So how do you kind of see that um, progression moving forward in the future? Yeah, you know, you see that with non-fungible tokens. I think you think you're buying a piece of artwork and really what's recorded on the blockchain is a URL that points to the piece of artwork you supposedly own on some server somewhere. So what happens when that server somewhere goes away? Well, your record of ownership is still preserved on that blockchain because it is the URL. <laughs> okay, suppose somebody changes what's at the end of that URL. Do you suddenly own something different? <laughs> that's that's a little weird. So that's another scalability issue I didn't get to. Really what you'd like to do is actually put that piece of artwork uh, into a recorded format like a, a blockchain, right? Uh, but again, that gets at the scalability of these things because an image or a movie or some piece of digital content typically consumes vastly more bytes than a simple transaction, right? It's just like, uh, you know, how many bytes does it take to record a transaction and quick and very little? How many uh, bytes does it uh, take when you take a picture on your cell phone? That's suddenly five megabytes. You know, it's a uh, really disparately sized uh, pieces of uh, digital information uh, there. But but I, I, I definitely agree with your uh, premise. Uh, I think there's the value of a lot of these things is pure speculation uh, right now. People see the value of something going up, so they jump on. You know, it's a pure momentum uh, play. I, and I would agree. I think many people don't understand exactly what they're buying. You know, would you have paid $97,000 for that uh, CryptoPunk uh, image? Um, I personally would not, but uh, people do. You also have to realize that a lot of these big crypto purchases are actually being made by these 
overnight crypto millionaires that are really just spending crypto that has suddenly become very valuable. They're not actually spending dollars, they're spending Bitcoin that suddenly became valuable. So that's a different vibe than if you decide to take actual dollars, dollars from your paycheck and go buy a crypto punk. Alan, I just want to jump in here for just for a second. The Q&A is going great, but I wanted to take a minute to say thank you so much for being our speaker at the, our inaugural Innovation Series talk. I, I know I learned a ton, uh, and you really set the stage for, for what's to come in the future in this Innovation Series. Uh, I, are you still good to answer some more I'm, questions? I'm, I'm here as long as it uh, takes. So as long as you keep asking questions, I'll make up answers. Well, I also well, I want to say thank you also to this phenomenal audience. I mean, the questions you've been asking have been great. We've all we've all learned from those answers. Uh, and Dylan, thank you for moderating, especially. And uh, audience, thanks for tuning in. I mean, we're really thankful for you uh, for joining us here on this inaugural talk. We hope to see you at future Titan Talks. If you have to leave, this session is being recorded. So you'll have a chance to tune in later to hear the rest of Alan's answers to these questions. So Dylan, next question. All right, let's get to it. Um, have you seen the adoption or support of crypto from higher education institutions? Uh, yeah, uh, well, obviously, uh, you're leading the vanguard there at Wesleyan. Um, if you look at what's going on at Stanford in particular, there's a bunch of uh, innovation going on there. Uh, there is a uh, crypto that's been downloaded by more than 25 million people uh, from Stanford called Pi, the Pi Network, P-I. And uh, it, it's just an app, you know, it runs on your phone and uh, it does not consume electricity. Uh, you mine Pi even if your phone is turned off because it is not using a cryptographic mechanism. So um, it's designed to solve a lot of these problems that uh, we discussed uh, here. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think a lot of folks are getting, getting into this. Yeah, and like, like you said, as someone who is involved in the uh, education to crypto kind of uh, connection there. I am seeing a lot more clubs uh, being introduced across universities. I've even had some of my friends start clubs at other universities, uh, but there are also classes being started at universities, uh, Stanford being one of them, uh, specifically kind of focusing on more of the uh, computer science aspect, you know, blockchain coding, that kind of thing. But uh, we are seeing more classes actually starting uh, at the higher education uh, parts. So, Moving along to the next one, let's see. Um, do you know of any farms or crypto miners supporting their operations with sustainable energy for ESG investing? <laughs> uh, no, and uh, I, I don't think that will happen because um, as anyone knows who has bought from a green power source, they tend to be a little bit more expensive than uh, your local utility. And so right now there is a bit of a premium paid for being green. I think as the mixture of electricity globally morphs from being fossil fuel fired plants to wind and solar, you know, that sort of thing, um, those costs will come down. And already in the US, the cost of wind and solar power is actually lower than uh, coal and that gas. So, uh, but, you know, it takes a while to build plants and wind farms and everything else. So uh, that will take place, you know, over the next 10, 15 years, I think. Uh, now, at the end of the day, these bit farm, uh, these uh, Bitcoin uh, miners, these crypto miners, it's simply an arbitrage between the price of electricity and crypto. So they move to any place, any jurisdiction that has low cost electricity, they do not care uh, what's being used to manufacture that electricity. Uh, what happens to the value of a cryptocurrency if a cryptocurrency company dies? Well, um, most of these cryptos are not backed by a company per se. They're backed by a governing body called the DAO, a Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So those are kind of, uh, you know, majority, or they're, they're really owned or operated by everyone using that crypto. So 
if you say that the organization dies, what it really means is that everyone's lost interest in that particular crypto. And <laughs> that happens uh, all the time. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are trying to create uh, crypto tokens, not, not money money, but uh, tokens to underpin various commercial uh, enterprises. These are typically referred to as utility tokens. And so, of course, every one of these guys hopes that their token will be the, the hot thing. And they've got a whole marketing strategy behind uh, this, trying to get crypto influencers to play around with whatever it is that they're offering and then start to use that crypto and trade uh, in it. And they typically get incentivized through a, a free crypto giveaway or a low cost crypto giveaway called an airdrop. That's another one of these funky terms that appears in this industry to try to get you to do it. But like previous, I think uh, number two here prediction said, a lot of these companies are gonna die, the token goes away and that's it. So if if you happen to own uh, those tokens, they become valueless. And it's like any other company going bankrupt, if you uh, own their stock, it's worthless. Right, and kind of adding onto that, um, a lot of times in our meetings, I like to categorize cryptocurrencies and put them into categories where I see fit. Like for example, Ethereum or Cardano, those are coins that are kind of backed by uh, the team behind it. And the people are investing in it because they believe in that team and they believe that they can push that specific cryptocurrency and token forward into the future versus something like Dogecoin where people aren't investing in it for like necessarily the technology or the future impacts of it. It's more of a, a hype thing, you know, it's, it's a trend. So um, I definitely like to categorize categorize my coins, it definitely helps um, me kind of kind of look at them in an easier, easier way. Um, but I think we're going to end this with the last question here. Um, how do you foresee companies bringing or bridging the large information gap between companies and the everyday person who might not have any interest in the space? Wow, that is a, uh, that is a good question. Um, I think uh, once you've had an opportunity to use this in a real world setting, uh, then you, you kind of suddenly get it, right? So uh, if you go to, um, you know, a gaming or gambling, but gaming, you know, I think there are so many gamers out there and uh, they say, oh, you can buy uh, properties for your character, or you can dress your character in Nike shoes. Uh, Nike's a big player in this stuff, by the way, metaverse. Um, and you do that with some form of token. The moment you do that, uh, I, I think you start to get it, right? And you know, once you see that a second and a third time, then uh, there's kind of nothing magic about it. And so I think the vast majority of us are going to experience it through situations like that. And so I think probably gaming is the one just because there are so many gamers out there and the metaverse seems to be, I should say gaming companies, metaverse companies are all moving towards uh, token-based um, revenue models, that that's how they're gonna experience it. I don't think the average person will care about what's underneath the hood. I don't think they're gonna care about a a blockchain or the network that propagates uh, who owns what or anything like that. Uh, I think they'll just say, oh, you know, I've got so many of this uh, token and I need to buy a, a wizard sword. And um, you know, that's how they'll experience it. All right, so I think that wraps it up. Uh, John, would you like to add? I'll close it out. Sure, I will. Thank you so much, Dylan. Alan, again, thanks for educating our uh, tightened community on all things crypto. Um, my head's spinning. Uh, it's been <laughs> an engaging hour and a half. Um, I'm going to credit our audience for, again, phenomenal questions and their engagement. Uh, thank them all for tuning in, and we hope to see them all at future Titan Talks. And Dylan, thank you for adding the student component. Uh, thank you for moderating, and uh, good luck to your cryptocurrency club. We hope uh, this drives even more uh, students uh, here on campus to, to join your club and 